So once again, good morning, everyone. I'm Diane Eberts. I'm welcoming you to our second lecture of our Art League 2020-21 series. Um, our speaker today is Victoria Cook, and we are very excited to have her. Maybe um, if you have the ability to see the gallery screen, if Victoria uh, could wave, <laughs> then we will then they, you will know who she is, okay? All right. Victoria Cook is the Director of Art Galleries at the University of North Georgia, where she also teaches courses on curatorial studies. She has previously served as curator at Columbia Museum of Art in Columbia, South Carolina, the Director of Lipa Ratner Museum of Fine Arts in Tarpon Springs, Florida, an Assistant Director for Curatorial Affairs at LSU Museum of Art, and the curator of European paintings for the New Orleans Museum of Art. Victoria attended graduate programs in art history at Tulane University and at the University of Delaware. She has unfortunately worked with museums through two major hurricanes, Katrina at Noma in 2005 and Gustave in 2008. Today, her role is very multifaceted. She is a curator, a professor, a mentor and administrator. So I will turn this over now to Victoria Cook. Thank Hi you everyone. And I will press share screen. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you for asking me to do this. Uh, talking about the in New Orleans is <clears throat> a little bit like going back and, and visiting old friends. This was the first major project I worked on at the um, New Orleans Museum of Art. We did a big exhibition in 1999 on Edgar Degas' time in New Orleans, um, and I was hired as a research curator, which led me then to eventually become the curator of European painting. So it is a really fun story, a really interesting and intriguing story, um, and very much a New Orleans story. So I'm going to try to share my screen. There we go. And put this up. There we go. <laughs> so the story of Edgar Degas in New Orleans um, is a story that not a lot of people know about. It's kind of a trivia question. Who's the one French Impressionist painter that ever traveled to the United States? And that's Edgar Degas. It's a story about him as an artist. It's also a story about him as a brother. Um, and a cousin and a family member. And it's also a story about him trying to figure out who he's gonna be as a painter, which he wasn't quite sure about at the time. We know Edgar Degas very much as the guy who painted modern life in Paris. He painted ballet dancers because they were actually a very new form of entertainment. And he painted the businessmen that wandered the streets of Paris, the stockbrokers, the bankers. And um, the subjects that interested him were not really traditional subjects. He wasn't, he was interested in appealing to these new business people um, who were self-made men. They were not men who had, who had just inherited a lot of money. They were not members of the aristocracy. So he wasn't interested in the subject matter that um, the aristocracy bought, like history paintings and religious paintings, even though that was where the money was. Um, and he was trying to figure out, was he going to appeal to the Met to the traditional um, buyer or was he, did he feel sure enough that there were these modern buyers? What we see him doing uh, before he leaves for New Orleans are paintings like this, which um, are kind of in between. They're in between the traditional style of realism and than his impression style on the other side, but still a modern, a modern scene. We generally believe that he figured out who he was gonna be as an artist when he was in New Orleans for that, um, that time that he was kind of on vacation. The story though belong, really begins before. It begins back with his maternal grandfather Germain Musson, who moved to New Orleans when Saint-Domingue fell to revolutionaries, right for the Louisiana Purchase. He decided, Germain Musson decided to send his five children to Paris to be educated. 
um, including Degas' mother, who's on the right. Um, this is a portrait of her and her sister, and where she met Auguste Degas, who was um, Degas' father. On the other side of the family, it was also very international. Auguste Degas' father had actually escaped the French Revolution, and he went to Naples, Italy, and started a banking firm. Then Auguste Degas went back to Paris and decided to, um, and opened up a branch of that banking family. Now, just a little note that you'll notice, the only member of the family who spelled the name Degas as one word was Edgar Degas. At some point in the past, some member of the family had concocted a fake patent of nobility, which made it seem like they were more prestigious a family than they actually were. And the spelling of it um, split apart like that, de ga, implies a kind of nobility that they actually did not possess. Edgar wasn't interested in that. Um, he said, the nobility is not used to working. I want to work, so I will take a commoner's name. So he switched back to the combined spelling. He also had absolutely no interest in the family business in banking. He wanted to be an artist and the rest of the family was incredibly concerned about that, whether or not he was gonna be able to support himself. Um, and the irony is that they were all businessmen. They were all particularly bad businessmen. And in the end, he was the one that wound up supporting the entire family uh, with, his, with his success. The um, children of Germain Musson mostly made, remained in Paris, as did Degas' mother. But her brother, Michel Musson, moved back to New Orleans and he married into the Langer family, which is a very prestigious family. And he eventually opened a, 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 a cotton brokerage in New Orleans. Degas' mother remained very close to her brother. Um, there are a lot of correspondence back and forth. The correspondence from the family is now at Tulane University in uh, their archives. When the Civil War broke out and New Orleans fell and was occupied, Michelle Musson decided to send his wife, Odile, and two of his three daughters to Paris. The third daughter remained in New Orleans with her husband. So we have here a portrait that was made by Degas while they were in Paris. They also had a little girl with them, a baby girl named Jo, Jo Balfour, that's Estelle's daughter. So seated in a chair, kind of um, hugging her stomach a bit is Odile Langer Musson. And she was very, she was ill at the time. And then seated is Estelle Musson. Balfour at the time, and then standing is her sister Desiree Musson. The, um, at the time, Estelle was grieving for her lost husband. Her husband died at the Battle of Corinth in the Civil War, just 10 months after they were married. So she's wearing, um, she's wearing mourning clothes. The Haldegaw family, particularly the brothers, um, were very fascinated with these, with their New Orleans cousins. And language was not a problem because everyone in New Orleans, not everyone, the French um, descendants in New Orleans all spoke French. And it wasn't until the Reconstruction era after the Civil War that the United States government started enforcing English in schools um, because it was a problem, or they viewed it as a problem. The Degas brothers um, showed the women the sights of Paris, and then uh, eventually the women moved on to Bourgogne Bresse, uh, which was really for Odile's health and also Estelle's health. Estelle at the time was going blind, and she eventually went completely blind. So you have Edgar Degas, the painter, then Achille Degas, and then the youngest was Rene Degas. The women stayed for three years. Um, and we know that Edgar did visit them at least three times. Rene, on the other hand, became a fixture there. They were all very intrigued by Estelle because she was such a um, figure of pathos. She's a young widow with a little girl. Um, she's going blind. Everyone in the letters refers to her in a way that almost seems saint-like. And this portrait is something that Degas did, painted of her while they were in France trying to capture her grief. 
And one constant in the portraits he did of Estelle is the fact that her eyes are so unfocused and shadowed, which, talk, which speaks to the problem she had with her eyesight. He noted um, in a letter to a friend, one cannot look at her without thinking that that face filled the eyes of a dying man. For his part, Rene had a fascination with Estelle as well. He fell in love with his cousin and he was a fixture uh, at the home that the women rented. He devised a plan to go back to New Orleans with them um, and return with them. And Michelle and his son, Estelle's father, was all for it. He had no surviving sons. He wanted somebody to go into business with him. And um, on the other hand, Rene was not interested in going into banking, even though that's what his father wanted him to do. Edgar was not going to do it. He was an artist. Shield de Gaulle was very temperamental um, and a little uh, tempestuous, so it just wasn't going to work either. But in the end, Rene did persevere right. and he returned to New Orleans with oh, the women. He said New Orleans was a place for young men with nerve and he felt that he could make his own way there. Open that up again then. So when he, uh, when he went back, he's dreaming, Rene is really dreaming of New Orleans as a very exotic place. He sees Estelle as this very um, sort of exotic romantic figure as well. And Rene was given to sort of flights of fancy. Um, he was very adventurous, uh, didn't sit still for very long. And eventually their romance would actually end in scandal and tear the family apart. But for now, Rene went back with them and then a shield to go followed him and they opened to their own uh, brokerage, cotton brokerage business in New Orleans. Rene went back in 1872 and convinced his brother Edgar de God to join him and go to New Orleans for what was supposed to be a two-month visit. And in 1872, uh, Edgar de God had not really taken off yet as an artist. He was 38 years old and he didn't know, he knew he had to sell work because he didn't come from a wealthy family. He was keenly aware of it. So he hadn't really settled down into what was going to be securely his subject matter and his style. Once he decided to go to New Orleans with them, Rene, of course, was very excited. He wrote to Estelle saying, prepare a fitting reception for the Grand Artiste. And it wasn't an easy thing to do. They went to England, they caught, um, they went on a steamer across the ocean. They went into New York, they stayed in New York for a day and a half, and then they had a four day journey by train. And Edgar was very interested in um, the trains. They didn't have sleeper cars in Europe yet, but they did in the um, trains in the United States. And he thought that was very interesting and very efficient um, and very comfortable. He was at this time really starting to be very concerned about his eyes. When he um, was in the Franco-Prussian War just a couple of years before in the National Guard, he discovered that there was a, he had a blind spot literally in his right eye and was unable to um, aim his gun. So he spent the, he was, you know, very concerned about was the eyesight problem hereditary, but since he did have this cousin that was going blind, they didn't know what caused it. Um, and he, of course, eventually also um, lost his eyesight late in life. The, um, they arrived in the depot in New Orleans about midday with the entire family uh, waiting for them. The first thing he noticed, which is often the case with people when they visit New Orleans, was the climate and how incredibly hot it was. Um, he said, one does nothing here, it lies in the climate, nothing but cotton. One lives for and from cotton. So those are the two things that really um, got to him. He arrived in October, so he didn't expect it to be that hot. We also know from records that it was unusually hot in December and January. So that was a shock to him as well. So, and he found it pretty unbearable. He also noted that the light was really harsh to him and there was this constant threat of yellow fever. 
But what he did enjoy was like Pontchartrain, he enjoyed the river and the space. New Orleans had a, a lot of space as compared to European cities. The, um, the homes were spacious and they were spaced apart. And he, um, he stayed with Michelle Misson and the Misson and Degas families, combined families, in the rented house on Esplanade Avenue. So this is the home, but you have to note that it's, it's in two parts. And at some point, historically, the house is split in two and pulled apart. Um, and now that's sort of part of the historic record, so they won't let them put it back together. But it is a bed and breakfast in New Orleans and houses a foundation, a Degas foundation. In that home, you had Estelle and Renee and their children. Uh, Estelle and Renee by this point had two kids. They expected a, four, a third to be born in December. And then of course, Joe Balfour from the first marriage. There was also Mathilde Misson um, and her husband, William Bell, and they had children as well. So it was a very bustling kind of place. In Paris, Degas went out a lot for evening entertainment, but we know, but he doesn't seem to have done that in New Orleans. At least he doesn't mention it. Instead, he sort of settles into this very domestic life. He, um, and that was part of partially, or that was probably as exotic to him as everything else. He wasn't a particularly domestic person back home. The opera, he noted, had been canceled for that year. So they stayed home and did rehearsals in the living room or the parlor. And this was very common in New Orleans. The families, uh, French families in particular, had pianos. And both Estelle and Renee were avid pianists. And so you're seeing here a sort of evening entertainment it's called the rehearsal. Uh, the titles that we use for Degas paintings are usually pretty arbitrary. He didn't necessarily name them that. Um, so we just use them for convenience. So what you're seeing on is Estelle on the right, and she's wearing a sort of jacket, and that hides her pregnancy. She at this point was very pregnant. And it was custom at the time to even hide that from neighbors. Nobody outside the family was supposed to know until the baby appeared in December. And then on the left is, we think, her sister Desiree Musson, who was unmarried and also lived in the house. And we think that's Renee at the piano. It makes sense. He's kind of a caricature, um, but it makes sense it's Renee. One constant with all of these paintings that he did in New Orleans is that he started them in New Orleans. He took them home and then he tinkered with them sometimes repeatedly um, throughout his life. We don't know, um, we assume he probably was supposed to send them back to the family, but because of a family disruption, that never happened. Um, and he kept them in his studio. He never sold them except for one. And that, uh, we don't know if that was sentimentality or he just thought they weren't commercially viable, we're not sure. So after he died, Rene went through and identified the ones that were from New Orleans, the ones that were of Estelle, that sort of thing. So the architecture of this painting is very New Orleans, and it would have been unusual architecture for him. The ceiling heights in New Orleans range from 12 to 20 feet, and that's because heat rises, and it's unbearably hot, so they want the heat to go up. Those wide moldings are also very typical as well. And you can see actually perspective lines in the, on the left where he was working out exactly how to get the angles correctly. The doors also very large, again, accommodating the heat. One thing that was also unusual for him, <clears throat> or he would have found unusual, was the way that they covered all of the furniture in white muslin. That's called summer dress. And um, in New Orleans, you would roll up the carpets and, and store them and cover all the furniture with white muslin, anything to deal with the heat. And because it was so hot that winter, they probably recovered the furniture um, because that summer dress appears in all of the, in several of the paintings. That also was not a custom in Paris. So it's not something he would have seen before. 
At the left behind Desiree, you can also see a sort of exotic, some sort of exotic tropical plant. <clears throat> and in the foreground, there's a, a sort of chaise long, and then the red shawl over it. So it has also a very casual family domestic kind of feel to it as well. It was ostensibly a family portrait. And he talks about how all day long he's among these uh, dear folk painting portraits of them. But he didn't necessarily stay um, true to it. We, he did do some uh, preliminary sketches of Desiree and Estelle. Then he went back to Paris. And he actually tinkered with them so much that the, the figures don't really resemble the original sketches. And we believe that his sister Marguerite actually stood in in the end for it. He probably uh, was kind of fascinated with these women in the family too, because they probably reminded him of his mother. His mother died when he was just 13. Um, so he didn't really have a maternal figure around. They probably had some of the same mannerisms and they, they seem to resemble each other a little bit as well. But the one um, that really took his interest was Estelle. Again, there was no problem with language for him when he was there because they all spoke French, which was very good because he had only one phrase of English that he could say and it was turkey buzzard, which he tried to work into any conversation. <laughs> According to his brother, he was fascinated with just saying turkey buzzard. Um, so Estelle, when he met her in Paris, was a young widow with a baby. In the time between that and 1872, when he travels to New Orleans, she became his sister-in-law. She had two more children. She was pregnant with a third by Renee. And then she also had gone blind, almost completely blind. And he was um, very fascinated with the way that she could move around the house um, and didn't really need much help. She recalled the rooms. I mean, he, he made note of her ability to cope with it to the point that it seems pretty clear that he's thinking about his own eyesight and very obsessed with what was going to happen with that. In some of the paintings, her pregnancy is a little bit more noticeable than others, um, but still hidden. This is a painting of Estelle that's in DC, Washington DC in the National Gallery. And she's seated um, in a very ladylike, proper fashion. She's seated on a, again, a chaise long with a white summer dress over it. And she's wearing light colors, but she's got the long sleeves. The V-neck is even kind of demure and uh, proper as well. And it's a very sort of quiet, subdued, introspective painting. Her eyes are completely unfocused, which is unusual for him. His, uh, most of his paintings, including of women, their eyes are very direct. And in hers, they're always very unfocused, which just reflects um, the problems with her eyesight. Another portrait that we believe is her is this one called one, that we call Women with a Vase of Flowers. Again, these are very arbitrator arbitrary painting uh, titles. <clears throat> we think this one was done after the birth of her child in December. And what's interesting, there are several things that are interesting about it. And one of them is, is the composition. It's an unusual composition. She is somewhat trapped um, visually and hemmed in. She's got a corner behind her. Then she's got the chair, the back of the chair on one side and this table that's kind of hemmed her in on the other with this unusually large or out of sort of almost out of proportion base and flower. She seems a bit trapped, but also on the verge of springing, moving in some way. If you look at her fingers on the back of the chair, they're tense um, and she's gripping them. Her face is in shadow, her eyes again are unfocused. She seems to have lost some of that weight in her face as well. She has this very soft, soft gaze, but even the um, leaves of the flowers seem to almost be over, uh, threatening to overwhelm her. The most, uh, 
well, I'll say the most famous of the of the Estelle portraits is in New Orleans Museum of Art. Um, it is also the biggest canvas that he did while he was there. And it's another one he kept in his studio um, until his death. And he actually went back to it late um, and added strips of canvas to it. He was still tinkering with it and still working on it. This is another one where you, um, her pregnancy seems to show a bit. She's got the, this black dress on that's kind of voluminous. Everything around her is pretty hazy and indistinct, except her and the flowers. This is not a finished painting. Um, it was not uh, varnished. He didn't, he didn't finish. He just kept messing with it over uh, a lifetime. The, you can imagine that this is something that he saw her do. You know, arranging flowers by scent and by feel, um, despite the fact that she was blind. You look at her face, it's in shadow again. Her eyes are unfocused, although, you know, they are looking towards the flowers. The way that this painting came into the collection at New Orleans Museum of Art, it's also a kind of um, interesting story as well. It came up for sale in the 1960s. And the director at the time uh, was James Burns, who was obsessed with the story of New Orleans, uh, Degas New Orleans. But there was no money to buy it. They just didn't have the money. I mean, by that time, the prices for Degas had skyrocketed. He devised a plan to have the people of New Orleans buy the painting to bring a style home. Children took up collections in school. Women's groups sold box lunches, and he spent his days on the streetcar in New Orleans on St. Charles Avenue passing a hat and telling this story. Um, and he got close, but didn't quite make it, and an anonymous donor came up at the last moment and, um, and took them over, over the top, so they were able to buy the painting. So it's now sort of one of the jewels of the collection at New Orleans Museum of Art. So Estelle is kind of depicted in family letters and even in the paintings as a very proper woman. Uh, she's described really in saint-like kind of terms in everybody's letters. Her sister Mathilde was a little bit more coquettish. Um, and this is a portrait of her seated on the balcony at the Musan house, holding a fan. And there are sketches for this one as well. With most of the paintings, we have a hard time knowing for sure um, who is in the painting. Is it Desiree or, or Estelle? Because it looks a lot alike. Um, unless you can tell Estelle is pregnant, that sort of thing. With Mathilde, we know it's Mathilde. She, um, she had a very distinctive look compared to her sisters. She, he's um, also looking at, in this painting, the architecture, again, of New Orleans. And you can see the hazy perspective lines. And this is something that in a painting where he was looking at the more traditional style of painting, he would never have left those perspective lines. But it's very much a Degas painting in the way that we come to think about him. Uh, behind her, you can see the cast iron um, balcony. She is seated in front of what we call French windows. These are windows that go all the way to the floor and they actually open up at least five feet. So it's easy to duck under them and go out onto the balcony. And that's very typical, again, of New Orleans architecture and not something he was used to seeing in Paris. And she's, you can tell from her dress, she's a little bit more um, outgoing than her sister Estelle. She's got um, and she's wearing this black ribbon in her neck. That was actually a very popular style in Paris in the 1860s. So it's a little behind the times, but that makes sense since um, she's in New Orleans. You know, it takes time for Paris fashion to find us over here in the States now, but it certainly did then. And she's holding a fan, something that women carried constantly because, because of the heat. A common theme in some of the paintings is illness, or it could be melancholy. We're not exactly sure which. Um, and this is something that he might have become interested in back in the 1860s when the French, the American family was in Paris, because Odile Langer was sick at the time. 
um, and then died in the interim. She had died by the time he came to visit. And Estelle was also suffering from eyesight. So um, the kind of idea that New Orleans women might be susceptible to illness or something like that seems to have taken him. The, um, both of these portraits, we are paintings, we actually think are Desiree Moussant. And they just seem to represent illness. But he talked about um, in letters, the, the overwhelming heat, making people a little languid, a little lethargic. Um, it may have been that it was making him languid and lethargic. People in New Orleans are pretty used to it. Uh, doesn't mean we like it, but we're pretty used to it. Uh, but they also might be indicators of melancholy too. We don't know of any great illness that anybody suffered while they were there. The most interesting of the paintings that relate to illness though is this one. This is called Le Garde Malade or The Nurse. And it's a, again, distinctly um, New Orleans architecture, the light colored walls in the tall ceilings, the tall doorway. The bed in the foreground probably belonged to the woman, um, whether it's Estelle, uh, sorry, whether it's Desiree or Mathilde, that might be Mathilde. At any given time, with the number of children, there are six children in that house, um, you know, one of them was probably sick. So she is probably watching over a sick child. And she's sort of wrapped in this robe and this hood over her nightgown and gazing in this way that's a little mysterious as far as what she can see. Behind her are those French windows, those incredibly tall windows. Um, and they're covered in a little bit of fabric to keep some of the light and the heat out. One of the reasons, this is actually my favorite of the New Orleans pictures, which may seem weird, but it's, the reason is that it had been lost in World War II. We actually thought it was destroyed. We were looking for every painting that he did in New Orleans. And this one we didn't look for because it had been marked as presumed destroyed. And we were working with a Swiss, um, art dealer, his family had been art dealers for generations. And I came into work one day and I had a fax from him with a smiley face and a handwritten note that he could get the nurse for me. He knew where it was. So this painting, the publication of it in the catalog in color um, was the first time people knew in decades that it had actually not disappeared. It had not been stolen by the Nazis. It had not um, been destroyed because they destroyed a lot of paintings that they did steal. And they were particularly, particularly fond of Impressions paintings. Um, so unearthing this painting was actually pretty exciting for us. Another one of the illness pictures is this one, a um, woman with a bandage. And she's got a bandage over her um, left eye and her right eye is red and swollen. You would think this was Estelle, it's not. Um, it doesn't look like Estelle, but the other reason is that her clothing is not, doesn't have that really refined fabric that we see in the, the clothing worn by Miss Teald and Desiree and Estelle. She may have been a domestic or just come from a more modest um, home and it might've been just, again, he's, he was very, very obsessed with issues related to eyesight. And there were no, there were so few treatments. There was no treatment out there that would have been helpful for Estelle, uh, which she makes note of. Now, I said there were a lot of kids in the house. Degas was not usually around kids. He shows, he has niece, he had nieces and nephews in Paris. He showed very little interest in them. Um, he's a bachelor. He was, though, taken with the way that the New Orleans kids spoke. They spoke French, they spoke English, and they also spoke a patois, which is a combination of the two. Um, it's a very fluid language, and you see that in bilingual um, cities today, like Montreal. Um, they'll do that as well. So he had um, been presented with six children, and then another one on the way. He made note um, that there were two that were his brother Rene's kids. 
And then there were three that belonged to Mathilde and her husband. There was Joe Balfour from the first marriage, Estelle's first marriage. He wrote, Pierre, um, Renee's son is superb. She's so self-possessed and the mixture of English and French is so quaint. Odile, his little girl is 12 to 15 months old. Joe, his wife, da wife's daughter has a feeling for music. There's also little Carrie, daughter of Mathilde, the younger of my cousins. Mathilde also decided to have another boy <clears throat> called Sydney and a little brat of two months old called Willie. The whole band is watched over by black women of different shades. So that's a lot of kids, if you're not used to being around kids. That's a lot of kids. Um, but he was also charmed by them. And again, he's 38 years old. So he wrote um, about his brother's family and being around them. A good family, it is really a good thing to be married, to have good children, to be free of the need to be gallant. E gods, it's really time one thought about it. So he may have thought about it, he never did it. He never got married, he never had kids. So Children on Doorstep is um, kind of an interesting painting too because it seems to foreshadow some dramatic events later on. You've got these, this mixture of children on, on the doorstep, a nurse, um, a black nurse that's taking care of them. And you're looking across the backyard, across the street to a cottage in the back. And we know who lived in that cottage. Um, it was a family, the Olivier family. The, um, and America Derive Olivier had been hired to teach music to the children, and she also read to Estelle. A few years later, she was also having an affair with Renee, and they ran off together in the middle of the night. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. He had a really hard time with the kids' ages. He, didn't, he couldn't figure out who was what age, and um, like a lot of people who don't have kids, myself included, um, so, he, we're not actually sure who's who here, and it really probably doesn't matter. There is one independent sketch for this painting, this little girl sitting there um, with her back to us with the ribbon behind her. Um, and that was probably uh, one of the girls that was sort of in between the ages, probably Carrie Bell. Then you have a small child that could be the daughter of Renee and Estelle, or it could be the son of, of William and Mathilde. We're just not sure who they actually are. The only member of, the, of this group that we do know the name of is the dog. The dog that is standing between them and that house across the street that's going to cause them a lot of trouble, and that's Vasco da Gama, the, a white mastiff that Edgar Degas actually um, took credit for naming. One of the big um, mysteries for the New Orleans paintings is how few sketches they are, there are. So Degas sketched in notebooks all the time and all of those notebooks that were in his studio when he died, they're in the archives now at the Louvre in Paris. There are very, very few sketches for these paintings and we don't know if he destroyed them at some point, or if they are, we're hoping they're hidden somewhere and they're going to be unearthed. We kept hoping that that was going to happen when we did this exhibition, that people in New Orleans who had them were going to go, oh, that's what that is. Um, but it just didn't happen. So it's a bit of a mystery. They're sort of still out there. The most famous of his paintings they did in New Orleans is this one. Um, and this one I will say a little bit about the title because for a long time it was called Portraits of the Cotton Exchange. Um, and this probably matters to nobody but art historians and people from New Orleans. It's not the Cotton Exchange. It's actually the offices of Michel Musson's um, cotton brokerage. Um, and we even know where that building was. There are photos of that room. So we, we've matched it up. Um, it was uh, a painting that he started kind of by happenstance. He was supposed to leave in January. He missed his train. So, you know, he's stuck in New Orleans a little bit longer and then he just decides to go, he decides he's gonna go ahead and stay until March. Uh, because he had taken on this idea of doing the portraits in the cotton office. 
all of his other paintings are are very domestic. They're the family, they're the world of women um, at the time, except for this one. We know that he went by um, both Michelle Musson's office and his brothers, uh, Rene and, and Achille's offices as well on a regular basis. He was taken with the hustle and the bustle of all of it. Um, he was very interested in businessmen. He was not interested in business at all. So what he, he didn't really make note of, we think, or we don't know, but they were actually going bankrupt. They filed bankruptcy at the beginning of February, Michelle Musson did. So the firm was actually being dissolved. Uh, and then his brothers, Rene and Achille, also had problems financially. They were deeply in debt to the Degas Bank back in Paris. And they had um, bought a lot of Confederate bonds, which was a very bad investment, obviously. So they were in some financial trouble. But he's actually more interested in this because it's a painting of modern life. It's, a, it's the kind of thing that interested him, people who are making their own money, making their own way. And he wrote to a friend of his, I have attached myself to a fairly vigorous picture. And in fact, he thought he had a, a buyer for it, a cotton dealer in England, he thought would buy it. That didn't happen, um, but it did was bought by the Museum of Fine Arts in Pau, France. So it was the first Impressionist painting to go into a public collection um, in France. In the final painting, there are four figures from his family. There's a shield de God leaning up against a window. William Bell is the one who's, who's holding the cotton out. And then Rene Degas is sort of loafing around in that chair reading a newspaper. And Michelle Musson is what he's doing in this picture is actually pulling cotton. So you pull cotton apart and you look at the fiber. So he's evaluating the fiber because he has to categorize it um, and then link it up, up to buyers. So Achille Degas and Rene Degas are just visiting. They don't belong there. They've got their own business. Uh, William Bell also did not work for the family business. Uh, he worked for the racetrack, but he's in there anyway. The guy seated behind Rene, perched on a stool, is James Prestige, who is one of the um, partners in the business. And John Leviday is actually at the um, working with the ledgers, probably looking at the damage, um, the financial damage the three partners all have their backs to each other. So they're either just absorbed in what they're doing or it is a note to the fact that they're, they're going bankrupt at the time. Unlike the other paintings, these are absolutely portraits. And even the people that we cannot identify, that we don't know who they are, um, seem to also have been portraits. The, um, so the figure of a shield, he actually drew in part from previous sketches he made of his brother. His brother always liked to wear a top hat or a baller. He was very, um, he was just very dapper. But those aren't directly related to the painting. It's just that he is always painted that way. The only sketch is this one, and it's John Leviday. And this is Degas' sketch for him in, um, in that corner. So, um, as I said, it was bought. Um, it was bought by Pope France. It was not bought by the um, by the buyer that he thought would be interested in it. But this is also the last time that we see him kind of paint in a fairly realistic manner. Um, there's none of this sketchiness to it. It's a modern subject matter. But the painting of it is somewhat more conservative. At the same time, he did this painting called, again, The Cotton Office. And he told that same friend, I am preparing another less complicated, more spontaneous, better art, where the people are all in summer dress, white walls, a sea of cotton on the table. And this one has that sketchiness that we actually associate with Degas. He didn't worry about the, um, the portraits of the people. 
they're very sketched in. Um, that's not important to him. Letting go of all of that allowed him to concentrate on the things that really mattered to him, which was making it seem spontaneous, making it seem modern, making it seem um, like there's, there's really activity going on. And after he went back to Paris, this is the style that he stuck with. Uh, he never really goes back. I don't want to really leave the um, story of Degas in New Orleans with follow without following up on the families and what happened to them. Um, Edgar went on to become Edgar Degas, the Degas that we all know. Two years after his trip to New Orleans, the first Impressionist exhibitions came on. And what's interesting about those exhibitions is that they're really business exhibitions. I mean, these guys, these, and, and Mary Cassad, um, got together and figured out a way to find their buyers and a way to sell their art um, and that they could do their own thing. So it turned out that he wasn't as bad at business um, as you might think. On April 13th, 1878, in the middle of the night, Rene and his neighbor, America to Reeve Olivier, took her children and ran off. They left. They went to Chicago and they obtained what were called Utah divorces, which were fake divorce papers. And then they got married bigamously in Cleveland, Ohio. Stay in the United States for a little while, um, but refuse any kind of intervention from Michelle Misson. I mean, the, the general rule is if you're going to marry your first cousin, you better stay with her because it explodes the entire family when you run off the way that he did. Um, a year uh, later, Estelle was granted a legitimate divorce and America and Rene got married. They moved to Paris and they had additional children. He was not allowed to see his children in New Orleans. He did not try to see his children in New Orleans and he didn't send money the way he was either. So Michelle Musson actually adopted them and changed the name back to Musson. So the entire family, of course, goes into complete disarray and poor Edgar is being hounded by Michelle Musson to help. He did, Edgar Degas did stop speaking to his brother for decades after this happened. Um, but they late in life sort of made, they made up. And there was a code of secrecy between the families. The children in New Orleans are old enough to remember their father, but not allowed to talk about him. The children in Paris had no idea that they had um, a half brother and half sister back in New Orleans until Renee's funeral, when lawyers showed up and demanded half of the estate. One of the things from the estate that they were awarded was a set of bronzes. When Edgar Degas died, these wax studies that he had in his studio were cast and then given to his family members. And the New Orleans family got a set of, this, of, the, of them. They sold them in 1950 and they get, except for one with the horse, which they gave to New Orleans Museum of Art. And the descendants who do still live in New Orleans remembered playing with these as kids. They would use the horse as a horse for their dolls. And their father would use the woman in a bath as an ashtray and put, tamp his pipe up against her knee to get the, to get the ashes out. The, um, There are no now living to gods. There are no to gods in New Orleans. There are a couple of people that claim they're to gods. They're not. Um, but there are descendants of the family, and they still do not have anything to do with their rich relative, their um, French relatives. So Degas' time in New Orleans is um, at heart a family story where he produced paintings and he produced paintings that we think were instrumental in his decision making about who he was. Um, so it was a very uh, important story, but not actually one that people know necessarily a whole lot about. So um, I'm going to end there. Do you all have questions? Shall I stop sharing my screen? Let's see. Uh, no, no, why don't you keep it up? Um, okay. I don't see any questions. Did um, everyone? Um, 
Well, we, ha we have had a nice, long, um, informative lecture. Maybe people are still digesting the information. Um, I guess I would ask how many um, Degas are in the New Orleans Museum of Art? Wow, um, I don't know that off the top of my head and I haven't been there in, um, since 2007, but um, there are a few, but this, the uh, Estelle portrait is the most important, certainly. Okay, all right, that's interesting. Yeah. And did, um, I guess my one other question would be about the family, um, the Moussin family, I guess, that's still in, in the New Orleans area. Um, were they um, involved at all or participated at all in the big exhibition that took place? They did. They brought in family photographs, um, furniture, uh, little things that they had left. Um, there was not, there was so much animosity that there wasn't a, a lot uh, between the families except the letters, which actually have been given to Tulane quite a while back. But they did bring in the family photos. Um, and there's a piece of furniture that one of them has that we think was used in the rehearsal. Oh, OK. Uh, there's a question that came in um, about being slave owners for the Mersan family slave owners. Not that we know. They, they never attained that kind of wealth. So they really weren't. There's, um, there's a side story about um, Germain Musson's brother had a long-term rela relationship with a free woman of color. And their two sons were educated in Paris and became engineers. One of them came back to New Orleans and he worked on the sewer system. Hmm. The other one stayed in France, Norbert Rieu, um, actually a very famous engineer. He, uh, man he found a new way to manufacture sugar, processed sugar. But we don't, um, we don't know, we know that the families, um, at least at that, at that generation, had a lot to do with each other, and that was extremely common with um, the French families, and, and the young men in particular would be sent to France, where the prejudices were not as, um, you know, not, not as prevalent. But we don't know that Degas ever knew about it. So it's intriguing but not something we know a whole lot about. Okay, there's another question about, um, do you have any comments about this um, visit of Degas to New Orleans being during the rec uh, reconstruction period? You know, he didn't seem to notice it. Mm -hmm. uh, and New Orleans, although it goes through construction, they're struggling financially, but it's not, um, it just wasn't something that hit them as, as much in any other way really than economically because they had not, um, they weren't, as far as we know, they were not slave owners during the war. Um, and New Orleans is a little different from the rest of the South. It's still a little different than the rest of the country. But um, other than the economic problems and the problems with financially that the Degas family had because Michelle Musson talked them into buying these Confederate bonds. Um, they didn't really seem to have a, um, you know, a dog in that fight as far as the war was concerned. They were more, because the Franco-Prussian War comes in in 18, you know, 1870 in Paris, so they're, uh, the Degas are much more uh, focused on their own backyard than they are what's happening in New Orleans. Okay. And then uh, one more question was um, in the, on the painting of the cotton, with a man looking at the cotton table, was he a person of color? Was he a black man? Let me go back. You mean here or here? Uh, it, the question doesn't say. <laughs> so, no, neither of them neither of probably them. were. All right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I think that might be. Oh, and um, one more. When was the Degas home divided? I'm not sure I understand that question exactly, but. Uh, because it was split into two. I, okay. It was long enough ago. There's a guy that has owned it, that owns it now. Oh, I see the um, actual home. Okay. Yeah. He wants, he wants to put it back together. And the Historic Preservation Society won't let him do it. So it must have been in the, er at least in the early part of the 20th century. 
Okay, great. Well, maybe we should all make a field trip down there and check out these things in person when COVID is over. <laughs> that it was what? Yeah. So um, thank you very, very much. This was incredibly informative. Um, we are probably at the end of our lecture time. So we will thank you again profusely. A thank you to all the people that have signed on and um, enjoyed the second lecture with Art League. And we will be continuing our season in the spring and we will be in touch with um, all of our members at that point. But in the meantime, again, Victoria, thank you so very much. Thank you. Very, very. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we'll all wave our hands. Thank you. And I will just keep saying Kalamazoo because it's a very fun word to say. It is a fun word to say. <laughs> okay. I will stop recording. <laughs>